All right, well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Harvard Catholic Forum. I am Deacon Tim O'Donnell, the program director here, and I'm delighted to welcome you, both those with us in person here at St. Paul's in Harvard Square and our virtual audience joining us through Zoom. At the Harvard Catholic Forum, Catholic thought and culture engage the academy, the professions, and the arts. In addition to our lectures, we offer an increasing array of non-credit courses, and in July, we will host our first week-long summer seminar. Check out our website at harvardcatholicforum.org where you can sign up for our newsletters and register for future events. And please consider supporting our important mission by making a financial contribution there. Tonight, we offer the fourth and final lecture in our Faith and Work series. Think of it. Work is actually what most of us spend most of our lives doing, more than anything else. Work understood in its total reality, not just a job for a paycheck, but taking care of others, household work, and tasks that we take on as volunteers. In this series, we address this fundamental aspect of our lives with insights from a variety of perspectives, the biblical vision, Catholic social thought, the theological tradition, and a Catholic anthropology and spirituality. Tonight we explore work in the future, looking at economic realities and insights from Catholic thought. In bringing these events to you, we are grateful for the collaboration of important co-sponsors. The Theology of Work Project, Uh, the Theology of Work Project, the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago, the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard, CAP USA, CAP Catholic Social Teaching in Action, CREDO, the Catholic Research Economist Discussion Organization, the Illumine Network, the Collegium Institute, and the St. Benedict Institute at Hope College. In addition, this event is made possible through the support of the John Templeton Foundation in the grant in Lumine, promoting Catholic intellectual tradition on campuses nationwide. Please note this event will be archived on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, please share the link to that channel with others who may be interested. All of our past events, including the earlier talks in the Faith and Work series, can be accessed in our archive at harvardcatholicforum.org. Before I introduce our speaker, let me give you a roadmap of tonight's event. The lecture segment will last 30 minutes or so, and then we will have an opportunity for some Q&A. Those of you who are here in person should have received a note card and a pencil when you came in. If you have a question, please write it on the, on the card. At about eight o'clock, one of my colleagues will come up the aisle and collect the cards and bring them to me. I will pass on as many as I can. Unfortunately, we are not set up technically to take questions from our virtual audience at the same time. Finally, please take about 90 seconds to fill out our quick post-event survey. Zoom registrants will receive one right after the event by email. And those of you who are here, there's a QRC code on the handout that you received. And so you can do that very quickly on your phone. Your feedback really is critical to us to evaluate and improve our programs. Tonight's speaker, Professor Mary Hirschfeld, is Associate Professor of Economics and Theology at Villanova University. Her work focuses on the boundary between economics and theology, specifically by developing an approach to economics that is grounded in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, with applications to consumption economics, economic justice, the common good, the nature of practical reason, and economic methodology. She earned her PhD in economics here at Harvard and later earned a PhD in theology from Notre Dame. Her book, Aquinas and the Market Toward a Humane Economy, was published by Harvard University Press in 2018. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mary Hirschfeld.
started with the bang. <laughs> that does mean every now and then I might need dropping down to get a little walk. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to this forum. It means a lot to come back to Harvard after 35 years. Um, and I've been trying to tell everybody who would listen, and I can't get them to focus on this enough. When I was here at Harvard the first time, I was not a Catholic. I was a wandering, spiritually inclined, but not religious type. And graduate school is a total misery, <laughs> or can be, because graduate school has many of the elements of not good work, of a bad kind of work. Um, you know, you're, especially in the dissertation phase, you're isolated at home, you're working really hard on something that may or may not have any effect on anything in the world. And in my case, the answer turned out to be no impact at all. Um, and, um, and you're trying to become a star in the department so you can climb the ambitious step. It's just a very soul stealing time of life. Um, if I've been back since my conversion, I converted in 1997, and I've had occasion to come back to Harvard, and I saw there was this thriving Catholic community, and I always wonder what would it have been like if I had been Catholic through all of that. Surely it would have helped. Um, I say all that um, partly to say that the fact that I am a convert is central to how I approach all of these issues. Um, I did go ahead and listen or watch the my previous three speakers on the subject. Uh, and it seems to me that what I have to bring um, to the question about the theology of work is the perspective of somebody who once inhabited a very secular mindset who has then moved over to a very Catholic mindset. Um, so what I plan to do in this talk, I've been asked to talk specifically about the future of work. And um, you can, well, not all ask me about it. I was just like, um, that's a really loaded question. I mean, it's just a huge question. There's so much, there's so much change going on. We have automation, we have globalization, um, the rise of the gig economy, all sorts of things are happening um, with work. And now we've had two years of pandemic in response to a pandemic, um, which caused a massive dislocation in all aspects of economic, social, political life. And so I, the one lesson you can learn from economists is um, it's very hard to see the consequences of things down the road. There's a lot of unintended consequences to the things that have happened. We had, we can't, I don't think anybody can credibly say they have any idea how the economy is going to unfold over the next decade, how work is going to unfold over the next decade. So what can we do? What, what I propose to do uh, is go back and revisit some of the principles that you've heard about in the last three lectures, but from a systematic perspective, I want to highlight certain principles. What does it mean to think about work from a secular point of view, which is what does it think, mean to think about work from a Catholic, a Thomistic point of view? What difference does it make? So those are the tools that I use to think about things. And, and then my um, plan will be to apply them to some specific topics so you can get a feel for, for what's at stake. Um, and then I want to look at two things that come out of the pandemic. Um, the potential for the rise of hybrid work, where people will be doing more than work from the home and some at, at, at the office, um, which I actually think is a promising, a hopeful trend that, that speaks to some of the issues that I'll be raising. Um, but then I also want to talk about what it means that we were willing to shut down life for two years and counting. Um, what does that mean for the overall sense of purpose and meaning we have in life? And that might point us to an even deeper spiritual level at which we need to engage these questions about meaning and value of work. Okay, so that's an overview of what I plan to do. Um, so this idea about these different mindsets, like I said, I inhabit them because I literally went from one to the other. I'm going to borrow the term from Charles Taylor and call them social imaginings. There's just presuppositions that we act out of, we don't even realize that they're shaping the way we encounter the world and process process it. Um, just certain things that just are unquestionable and we don't even realize that we're not questioning them. Um, <clears throat> so it's sort of like a social imaginary is like what, what water is to a fish. It's, it shapes their whole environment, everything about them, and they may not even know that they're in the middle of the water, much less be able to question it. Okay, so what I want to do first is sketch out briefly what I take to be some of the fundamental aspects of the social imaginary modern secular society, the one that I inhabited back when I was here at Harvard. Um, and then I'll take up the one that I get from Thomas Aquinas. 
Okay. So starting with the modern view, um, we're going to start. We're going to focus on the topic of happiness because happiness is what directs all of our actions. So in the modern view, happiness is roughly understood as being the fulfillment of our desires. Um, whatever it is that we want, we want what we want. And the, and the big challenge that occupies us is trying to get what we want. Okay? Uh, and it turns out, and this is really crucial to our understanding, um, that our wants are open-ended. Okay? So <clears throat> this idea that I want what I want, and I'm going to want something more, and I'm going to want something more, it's just going to keep playing out forever, was laid down in the modern psyche very early on. Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan Book 1, Chapter 11. <laughs> And he's marking this as a big shift. I'm going to paraphrase because it is old English. Um, but he writes this. He says, when we think about the happiness of this life, um, it does not consist in the repose of the mind satis <clears throat> satisfied. Because there is no such ultimate aim or greatest good as is spoken in the books of the old moral philosophers. No, no person can live whose desires have come to an end. Um, you can't live that way anymore than you could live if your senses and imagination has suddenly stopped. Happiness is a continual progress of the desire from one object to another. The attaining of the one you have is just pointing you on to the way of another. <clears throat> because of that, that object that a man desires is not only to enjoy once and only for this time, which we're sure forever to wear this desire. Okay. If we stop desiring, we would be dead, is how I understand what he's saying. And then our then preoccupation is not only making sure that I get what I want today, but also trying to set myself up so that I can get what I want tomorrow and the day after that, the day after that. Okay. Now, these ancient philosophers that he's disparaging certainly did think that happiness was the repose of the mind satisfied, that happiness is resting in whatever is the ultimate good that we desire. Um, and from their point of view, what Haas is describing is actually a vice. It's the vice of planexia, um, just this endless, restless desiring of more. And from their point of view, if I just desire one thing and another and another, it never comes to an end, it has no point, right? It's just kind of aimless, and it, and it adds up to a meaningless life. Okay. Um, now, there's two important things to observe about this modern social imaginary. Number one is we take our desires as given. I'm not going to talk about this too much, but we just kind of assume that you want what you want. Woody Allen once famously said, the heart just wants what it wants. And that's sleeping with my 13-year-old chocolate daughter. Um, we take them as given, and there is no idea that the real adventure of life is not just getting what you think you want. It's learning what is desirable, what is good to want. Right, reflectively considering what we should should want. But from my point of view, the second aspect of Hans's vision um, is that it means that whatever is in your desire set, and you could be a greedy person and want to have big penthouses and yachts, that's certainly possible. But your desire set could be more noble. You could want to help the poor, you could want to learn. There's all sorts of good things you could do with your desire set. But once you take this idea that I always want one thing after another, after another, whatever that thing is, um, you do end up placing at the center of your life something like greed. Money ends up being a lot more important, even if your set of desires are not necessarily attached to that. So how does that happen? Let's say I'm Mother Teresa. Let's imagine. Okay, and, I, and my goal in life is I want to help as many people as possible. First this person, and this person, and this person. So it still has that form of one after another, after another. What's the thing that's keeping me from progressing out of my ladder of desires? Well, I need more money and I need more time. I'm always constrained by my resources. Okay, so whatever it is that's on my ladder of desires, the thing that's holding me back are my resources. And that means that all of my attention, or at least a lot of it, is going to be focused on loosening this constraints. I'm going to want more money and I'm going to want more time. Um, so as a result, I'm going to think I never have enough money and I never have enough time. Okay. <clears throat> the reason why that's important is if you step back for a minute, you realize that money and time are both instrumental. They're not goods in themselves. The reason I want money is because I want to buy something. The reason I want time is because I want to do something. Um, and whatever it is that I'm wanting to buy or wanting to do, that's the real good. 
But because I have this endless ladder where I'm always held back by the resources, I'm going to end up treating that instrumental good as the ultimate good. Okay. So there's a couple of consequences of this. We can all know in principle, and everybody does know in principle, that there, <clears throat> there are many good things in life that are worthy of pursuit um, other than just money. We're all going to tend to prioritize the economic aspect of it. It's just going to seem more weighty than it really ought to be. Um, we'll tend to think that there can often be trade-offs between these economic goods and the other higher goods. Um, and sometimes we might even be willing to sacrifice those higher goods because of financial considerations. The day that completely broke my heart was one of my students, after hearing all this stuff from me, raised her hand to say, you know, my deepest heart's desire is to be a first grade teacher. I would just love to do that. But it would not be rational for me to do that because she wouldn't make enough money. She's taking this amount of good and prioritizing it over her ultimate goods. Okay. Um, so that's a big consequence. And, and I, I think it's very hard in our society with our social imaginary and we've all been torn by it to really escape that. The other aspect of it is because we're putting money and time as being central objects that we care about, um, notice that those are things that are quantifiable. And, and we tend to measure all those values in terms of those things that can be quantified. Um, and it tends to flatten the world. We tend to stop seeing exactly what the nature is of the business we're pursuing and think that it's monetary terms. And there's a dehumanizing aspect to that, especially when we attach these dollar values to humans. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, we have some economists here. So, in economics, it's, in Econ 101, you'll often talk about a production function for an economy. You'll say output is a function of capital and labor. I've had a chocolate. Like, output is a function of K for capital and L for the labor. And notice the K and L are now completely interchangeable. I'm going to do all my equations where I can trade back and forth between the two of them. And somehow my labor has now become no different in any important way from the capital. It's right next to it. Okay. So it's this tendency in our thought that allows us to look at workers primarily as a cost of doing business, a cost that can be reduced by, say, mechanizing and replacing them or by outsourcing to other places. Um, and, and, and if that's our main primary mode of view, any other ethical impulse is going to seem like an imposition on the economic imperatives and seem to be in tension with them. Okay, so those are just a few of the consequences of living in the modern secular social imaginary. Okay, so now let's look at, I'm going to take up the optimistic view, okay, the alternative view. From Aquinas' point of view, we are indeed pursuing happiness. Okay. So there's agreement on that point. For Aquinas, um, not surprising, for him, the ultimate happiness, the ultimate good we're seeking is beatitude with God. We want the beatific vision, right? Um, which sadly turns out to be not available to us in this lifetime. So you gotta wait for it. Now notice, if our ultimate happiness is the beatific vision and God is infinite good and all of that, he's actually acknowledging something that Hans said, which is that our desires have this infinite quality to them. Right? That it really isn't, wouldn't make sense to sit here in this world and feel like you could rest and repose completely in some, you know, some happiness here. Okay. But he's going to reject the idea that we then pursue happiness in this life as though it's the latter of desires. The way he's going to think, or at least the way I think about it in light of his thought, um, is once we notice that our ultimate desire is God, then we have to ask how do we relate the goods of this life? to that ultimate good, okay? And here's why I normally like to spend 10 minutes geeking out on the theology, because it's super cool. I'm gonna to try to abbreviate it very quickly. You have three options on this question. Option one is to imagine that God is infinite good and all the finite goods just kind of lead up to God, okay? This is making the theological mistake of using univocal language between God and the creatures of the world. And I won't tell you why, but that's a big no-no, okay? That makes you a heretic, okay? Um, but notice, if I think that God, you know, the infinite good of God is just sort of qualitatively like the finite goods leading up to God, um, I'm inviting myself to view that ladder of desire, the one that the secular imagination inhabits. The other alternative, theologians who realize that we don't want to talk about God and the goods of this world in the same breath, say that the way to keep God transcendent and understand the mysterious grandeur of him is to say you can't talk about him at all in earthly terms to keep him completely 
divorce, in which case our daily concerns about trying to find happiness in this life that have nothing directly to do with the happiness that we're aiming at. That's the theological mistake of using equivocal language about God. When we're talking about God, we're saying something completely different when we're talking about human goods. Okay. So Aquinas' path through the sticky wicket of either God is the same, you know, in the same vein as the goods of this life are completely separate, is to say that the happiness of the goods of this life are analogically related to the beatitudes that we hope to know. Um, so what does that mean? I think that it's like a reflection that everything that's good in this world reflects God's goodness one way or another. For the simple reason that God created it out of nothing, there's no, if you see anything good, it has to be something about God that you're seeing some, some relationship to it. So it's like this mirroring thing. Okay. So the question is, if, if the goodness in this life, the happiness which in this life is supposed to be a mirror of a reflection of this infinite joy that we're hoping for, um, what does that look like? What does it mean to reflect an infinite goodness into a finite creation? And there's two key principles that Aquinas gives us. Number one, God reflects the goodness, the superabundant, infinite goodness into this world by creating a multiplicity of diverse goods. No one created good could possibly say anything about God because it's, it's too finite. But if I have an apple saying there's an apple-like quality to God, right, and an orange saying there's an orange-like quality to God, and I've got both apples and oranges kind of firing off together and seeing something. Right? The analogy I like to use is if you think of the infinite goodness of God as a white light, you shoot it through a prism, which would be like coming into the finite creation, and it spreads into a rainbow of colors. And each color doesn't directly point you back to that white light, but they're each carrying something other than it. Okay. So principle one means we need to respect the diversity of goods. And notice that that's in tension with this habit we have of one to quantify everything and collapse them into one single. Okay. The second thing, though, is since God is one, and we have all these diverse goods, all those diverse goods must be ordered to each other in one way or another. There has to be a thick, thick web of relationship. Pope Francis is extremely eloquent on this in the law of to see. Um, <clears throat> just think of the, the bees with their little hairy legs going to the pollen. Like, there's just this relationship everywhere. The cow is chewing grass, but then it poops, and the fertilizer does other things down there. It's just there's relationship everywhere. So there's ordering in creation. And another aspect of the ordering that is also part of reflecting God is some of the diverse creatures reflect God more strongly than others. There's a hierarchy of goods. The classic one is just rocks reflect God's living um, existence. Um, vegetal, veg, vegetables, <laughs> plants, the plant world reflects God's living quality. Animals reflect the ability to sense, perceive. Pokemon, right, engage the world, and humans reflect most highly the ability to engage truth, reason, and actually worship God consciously. So there's this principle of ordering matters. And the second aspect of this hierarchy of goods is obviously important. As we try to steer ourselves towards happiness, we need to respect the hierarchy of goods, right, and think about goods in a proper order. Okay. Because each creature is in the world to reflect something of the goodness of God, its own beatitude, its own happiness in this life comes out of reflect, doing that reflection well. That's what we're created to do. Um, so when my dog Winston is running around Winstoning, right, he's, he's doing his job. He's reflecting God's goodness the way he's supposed to do it. The psalmist will sing of all creation sings praises of God, right, because everything doing its thing is in fact praising God and it's fulfilling its own nature. All right, so that's a little bit of the theology. So what does this mean for us? Okay. <clears throat> it means that our happiness as human beings created in the image and likeness of God is found in perfecting our, finding a perfection in our own selves, right? Living a good, like if Winston is Winstoning and celebrating God, then I should marry Jehoshaphat and, <laughs> and Winston that one. Um, it's, it's, to, it's to bring to fruition all that's possible in our own nature. But all that's possible in a finite sense, right? So my calling to witness to the goodness of God is, is to do my vocation as work me in work, to, to be me in relationship with people I'm in relationship with. I don't have some idea that I'm supposed to be the it girl for everybody, right? I'm supposed to play this one role, I'm supposed to play it well. So what does this involve? For Aquinas, it involves cultivating my virtues. The, um, and virtue doesn't mean being a good two-shoes who doesn't drink too much on 
Saturday night. Um, cultivating my virtue means classic virtues. So I want to have a little bit of courage so I don't run away from everything just because I'm afraid of it. I want to have temperance so that my desires don't cast for me more than they should. I want to be able to treat my other fellow creatures, especially my human creatures, with justice. I want to have prudence so I can discern what is what should be done in a given point in time. And for Aquinas, <clears throat> because I'm ultimately in relationship with God, I want to have charity, hope, and faith to direct me towards my final. Where's the My Um Okay. Other parts of my happiness or fulfillment is because we're all social creatures, is, is living in community and developing my relationships with other people. I just am who I am because my mother and father are the people who brought me into this world, my relationship with my brothers, defining who I am. Your teachers are defining who you are. You're defining them as teachers by being their students, right? It's our community lives in which we come to know ourselves and love each other, which means obviously we should care for each other. That virtue of justice is perspective of us because I'm a social person. And so being able to treat you justly is important to my own happiness. Part of our ultimate um, fulfillment as human beings because we have this rational capacity to pursue the good, the true, and the beautiful. And I think because that's pointing us back to something of God in a higher sense that we have to access to as human beings. And ultimately our greatest joy is worshiping God. Okay. So that's the picture of happiness. And you will notice that I did not mention money. And the reason I did not mention money is it's an instrumental good. Right? So on Aquinas' view, you are born into whatever circumstances you are. You have whatever vocation, whatever calling you have, whatever path in life. It's going to be your way of witnessing to God's goodness. You should be able to figure out what material needs you need in order to sustain that life. And maybe oversimplify. You should be able to think, you know, I have, my vocation is this. To live that life well in this community, I would need $80,000 a year. You should be able to figure out what you need. And then once you have that, you have it. And any other money you have would be completely surplus to you. It would be available to go to other people. And notice what a huge flip this is on the modern social imaginary. This is the biggest one. Well, a lot of big ones. This is a big one. What sort of things I should buy? I ask, how much money have I made? How much can I afford? Right? It just it, it goes with that. Um, whereas on this view, I, I ask first, how much do I need? I try to get it, and if I don't have what I need, I'm going to experience poverty. But I'm going to be just other people, or maybe I won't if I'm selfish. We have these tensions and trade offs, but we all think of ourselves as kind of atomistic individuals. And we think of social happiness like the common good is something like if I just add up everybody's happiness, I have some kind of aggregate measure that I can use. Um, <clears throat> this, is not the, this is not the Catholic view. The, the common good that ties us together is the fact that I'm only fully me if I'm in a relationship with you. So our good matters together a lot. Okay. So that's a very quick sketch of this, this, this apparatus that I used to think about these things. So what does it mean for work? I'm going to try to do this in five minutes. Um, so the modern view is this the one that we're familiar with. If you ask about work, there's two ways you're mostly going to think about it. You'll think first in terms of how productive is, is work. How much, how much value does the laborer give us? How much economic value do the workers produce? That would be one question you would ask about work. And the second thing you might ask about is compensation. What economic value do workers earn through their work? And it's all done in economic terms. Um, okay. The Thomistic view is considerably richer, and I know that you've already heard pieces of it from the previous speakers, but I will rehearse them again. And again. Um, number one, first and foremost, work is how we exercise our creation in the Imago Dei, our creation in the image and likeness of God. Um, <clears throat> We are, in some sense, co-creators with God. He put us in this world in order to shape it through. Okay. 
to me is very important to us. If I'm a butcher, my contribution, when I go to work, my mission is to provide meat for my community, hopefully you know, well handled and well delivered. Um, <clears throat> conversely, when I pay my butcher, I'm giving him a signal, a sign that his work has been of value. So part of work is the dignity of contributing to the well-being of your community, serving it through whatever work you're doing, um, and then hopefully being honored by the community by, through the gesture of paying a wage and also giving people the respect of their duty. Work is also the locus of building relationships in the workplace with customers and suppliers. Um, and I could go on and on. You get the feel to, that work has many, many aspects to it that make it the good thing that it is. Um, and as speaking of what Donald said at the beginning, um, work is what we do most of our waking lives. It takes up a good chunk of our, our life. So it's, it's, it's a central um, locus where we express when we find our human dignity, realize our human potential, and do all these things. Okay, so I'm judging I have maybe 10 minutes left. Maybe five or 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to give one short example so you can get a feel for how this works, and then I want to take up the questions I asked about the effects of the pandemic. Um, I'm often asked how to think about economic justice and equitable wages and what should we do, you know, should we have a minimum wage, what should we do about that. Um, but if you take the optimistic view, you say, well, it certainly is important to give people just wages to the extent that that's possible. Um, but I would say when you're thinking about the justice of, of what's happening with people who are on the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, it's not just a matter of whether they're being, what the wages that they're being paid. What matters at least as much as the dignity and the respect that you offer people. So the fact that the people at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder tend to be invisible to us is at least as big of a problem, if not more so, than the fact that they're underpaid. Part of the reason why this is important is economists will often point out that a growing economy means that the people at the bottom are actually a lot richer than the people at the bottom used to be. Um, but this view says there might still be an issue if there's a social distance, if there's a disrespect or an un undervaluing. I think that's a significant aspect of what's going on in our world today. Um, so the people coming to the class tomorrow will talk about that more. That's just one, one example. Okay, so the pandemic has happened. Um, prior to the pandemic, I had actually already started doing some work. I have a paper that I need to kick out to send out for publication. Um, Talking about household production in light of this, I had an earlier concern about women and what they did at home. I had found these old home economists from the 1930s, and their perspective on work was really illuminating. In retrospect, it was Aristotelian or optimistic, and I just didn't know what to do with it as a pure economist. Um, but if you think about the role of a housewife, because it used to be a housewife, um, her work actually ma matches a lot of what I just described as being the good value of work, right? It's done for the sake of the good that's being produced. It's not done for monetary exchange. Um, it's done in relationship. It's a way for her to develop her own talents and capacities to serve her community and all the rest of it. Um, but there's an interesting story to be told because when women have a chance to move out of the household into the market, they took it um, in overwhelming numbers. And as a result, the amount of work in the household has tended to be replaced by market production as much as possible. Um, and now we're even outsourcing childcare and things like that to other workers. And a couple of things happened with that. First, women have come to increasingly mirror the market values that, that just carry the social imaginary of the secular world about the value of compensation and money and all of that. Um, so uh, whereas, 100 years ago, a good chunk of adults, working adults, would have had a different experience of economic life. It's now a lot more homogeneous on the other side. But the household itself has been evacuated of meaning. It used to be a locus of work and production of goods and values and so on. And now people are leaving the household to go do the work. The kids are leaving the house to go to school. And the house is sort of like a dormitory where you maybe may or may not meet and have dinner together. Um, <clears throat> And it's really, really hard to imagine how you cultivate people with an idea of cultivating virtue in such a in such a in such a household. So I had never really known what to do about it. And then the pandemic has happened, and a lot of people were forced to go back home. 
and take care of their kids. Um, I have one student at Villanova right now who's finishing up her senior honors thesis, where she's interviewed a lot of these women. And what she's finding, and it seems to mirror what I'm hearing from other sources, is that uh, women overwhelmingly, they don't want to stay home, having gone home for a while. I mean, some might, some will. But they also don't want to go back to full work either. But they really are looking for a hybrid solution where they can work at home for a couple of days and do the tele, you know, the Zoom and all that, but also go to the office because physical presence matters there as well. But it suggests that there might be that this two years, which has been so strange, might have opened us up to the possibility we want to reorder our priorities and get back to you know, get back to the things that really matter. And intriguingly, maybe even at the expense of salary. So a lot of women in my student surveys are saying, I would take a job cut in order to have this kind of flexibility. Um, and that's speaking from a spirit that's more closer to the optimistic spirit that I was talking about. So I regard that as a hopeful sign, or at least a place where we might see some cultural change. Okay. The last thing I'll say, and I'll try to keep this to about three minutes. So that was my hopeful sign, my less hopeful sign. <laughs> Um, even prior to the pandemic, Ross Douth had put out a book called um, The Decadent Society. I don't know if any of you have read it. Um, he argued that our culture seems to have lost gas, that our genuine progress really is kind of stalled out, except for this, whatever's going on with this tech stuff. Um, but that it's nothing like the transformations you had from going from horse and buggies to cars, from going from letter writing to calling people on the phone. We haven't had these major transformations. Um, he talks about cultural stagnation, which is my personal favorite. Noticing that most of our movies are just like, you know, <clears throat> sequels and remakes, um, that a lot of the vitality has gone down. He points out that we have this political sclerosis about which nobody ever needs anything to be said, this kind of splitting apart and the fact that Congress can't seem to legislate anything for anybody. Um, and the last thing he talks about is our declining fertility rates. A failure to reproduce ourselves, which is now spread out over most of the globe, not quite all of it, but a lot of it. And he says, all of this speaks to a culture that somehow has lost its larger purpose. That's his thesis. And the larger purpose might be, say, finding new territory. Maybe we could try to go to put a colony up on Mars, and that would revitalize us. Maybe it's because we've lost our transcendent aim, no longer our religious culture. So he concludes his book saying, we should either shoot for the stars or get down on our knees, or preferably both, right? If we want to cure this maladies. But it, it seemed to me that then when the pandemic rolled around, Balfour's thesis was, became a lot more convincing to me. The reason it became more convincing to me is whatever you thought about whether our reaction was the correct one or not, and there's been all sorts of political polarization around this. Very, very, very few people on any side of the debate was willing to notice that we just spent two years with everybody shutting down or muting their lives one way or another. My teaching goes on Zoom. It's not the same teaching. Some people just withdraw altogether. We spent two years saying ordinary life is not the most important thing. Um, and if you think about it, the reason why public health is a, such a big value is because we think ordinary life is a, such a big value. We gave up on birthdays and bar mitzvahs, confirmations, weddings, junior <coughs> proms. There's been a deferral everywhere. People had to die alone. The whole spectrum of ordinary human life has been muted. And it seems to me that that speaks to culture that, as Don Fett was suggesting, maybe has lost its sense of why the T loans, why we get up out of bed, what's the significance or importance of this. Part of the reason why I snuck this into my talk at the last minute. And I had lunch with my nephew today. And he was just talking about, I'm about to graduate, and I just don't see what the point is of anything. I think I'll go out and try to have some fun, because what else is there? And it seemed to me that that spoke to this kind of something sapping out of our culture. So if you want to retrieve the meaning of work, it feels like you have to have some sense of a deeper purpose, because work is always still instrumental. It's right, producing those goods and services that themselves are towards some larger common project. Um, so where I'm going to conclude is that you might be in the exact right place for this. It feels like we need a religious renewal. But there, and it doesn't work. Well, it has to be Catholic, but <laughs> I won't insist. Okay. But just something that digs deeper into what it means to be a human 
that possesses people and gives them a reason, especially for young people, especially for young men, a reason to get engaged with the cultural project, to give meaning and energy to work. Um, and if we don't do that, I'm not sure that our future work is looking very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if other people have questions and want to jot them down, please uh, put your hand up and, and someone will bring them to me. Thank you. So um, let me start with, oh, let me start with this one because this, these were the first two that rolled in. Can you say anything about your conversion and perhaps uh, how that redirected your work and so on? Um, so I'm going to, uh plug. I gave a whole talk on my conversion story. Uh, if you Google my name and the Faith and Reason lecture, you should be able to find it. It gives you the 45-minute answer to that question. Um, my conversion was out of the blue. I was the seeking pagan in Los Angeles, spiritually seeking pagan in Los Angeles. I went out to the desert and prayed to the great mystery going, what's next? And the answer was six weeks later, I was in the Catholic Church going, huh, that's really weird. <laughs> And then I, you know, but then my whole world just upended. And somehow the, the social imaginary I was describing from Aquinas became native to me. That's my story. Thank you. Um, let me ask a very specific one. Um, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. such an important part of our you know, culture and growth and so on. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing the, the question, what would you say about entrepreneurship? Maybe uh, more specifically, it's, you know, you don't get into something like that unless you want to kind of make it big. Um, what does that have to do with the, um, with the Thomas view? Um, so, you know, you guys realize, I'm going to try to say this all in 30 minutes. I can't possibly <laughs> explain all of the details. But one of the important points is the difference between good work and bad work is good work is for the good that is served, right? So the good physician wants to heal, right? And the bad physician wants to heal so that he can get paid. And that there's a corruption that happens to the physician if they convert him. And it seems to me that entrepreneurship is very much in the same vein. So it turns out that a lot of the great inventions that fueled the industrial revolution that got the prime, you know, pump, prime the pumps of our economic growth um, they were inventions that came from um, British guys puttering around in the shed, um, who were obviously just interested in, in the tinkering and, this, and the natural world, and they just loved it. And then somehow they had a steam engine. I'm not sure if that's the exact story, but, but and then it happened to make a lot of money. Not necessarily for the guys who did the inventing. John, John Walker tells us this. Um, but then you can imagine the entrepreneur who's just saying, what would be the cool thing I could do that would for gig? That would make me a lot of money. And sometimes the incentive to try to make a lot of money is going to force you to do something that's reasonably valuable to somebody, right? There's going to be some curve there. But if you can get away with cheating, you're going to do it. Um, my favorite example of a really bad business is um, I got from a book called Addiction by Design by Natasha Dauschul. Um, so she's talking about the, the video games you play in Las Vegas, specifically the ones that do poker. They had designed that thing, that those machines, to hack your brain completely and suck you in there. So little, the, the payout structure is meant to ping your little hype phones and keep you batting at the, as much as possible. The sounds, the bells, the whistles are all engineered to keep you there. If you go into those gambling centers, um, there's no lights, so you can't you lose track of time. Um, there's, it's a maze, hard to get in and out. They're tracking your behavior, so if you're starting to lose, they'll show up with drinks, and if you're really starting to lose, they'll show up with chips to keep you going. Um, the whole thing is there to suck you dry. Now, most people are immune to that. But they're, they're aiming at the 10% that are not immune. The whole business model is to find people who can be destroyed this way and destroy them. Okay. Well, they make a lot of money. So that's bad entrepreneurship. Okay. All right, here's, here's a question to put you through your, your um, theoretical um, uh, paces. As a Thomist, how do you think about Rawls's property-owning democracy as an instantiation of justice? In what ways is it compatible, not compatible with the distribution of uh, Chesterton and the law? Mm -hmm. Uh, are these theories reflective of a Catholic anthropology and in an increasingly universal basic income, 
oriented policy discussion of the future of work? Okay, there's many parts to that question. So I'm just going to cherry pick. Um, seems to me that Rawls is not an indication of how to pursue economic justice, because as I read Rawls, um, he's accepting the basic premises of the social imaginary, that the thing that matters for individual happiness is their access to resources, um, and that we're fundamentally each individual's personal our own project. And then what he says is, because we have a sense of fairness, we might come to see that we want to set up a set of institutions and arrangements such that the least well-off person is as well-off as they can be. That's his gesture towards the power of markets and incentives. Um, and that's his idea of fairness. But notice, it just keeps us wanting. It says that it's the goods that matter more than anything. Um, and I have a hard time imagining that if you, on the one hand, say what really matters is how much you have, you can turn around and then persuade people to go past, okay, yeah, I can see it's fair to actually do it, right? If, if I think my own personal happiness is based on how much stuff I have, I don't know that I'm gonna to wanna to tax myself to make myself poor. Um, I, I might find ways of telling myself that's all I want by voting in certain ways, but then acting in very different ways. It just, so the Thomistic approach is asking for that deeper conversion to really see that my good depends on your good in an immediate way, which is gonna make me a lot more readier to, to do that. Um, what was that? There was, Distributionists, they're good Catholics, so go them. <laughs> <laughs> the last one was interesting, though. Remind me, was the last sentence of that? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, so. Oh, universal uh, basic income. Yeah. 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 So uh, hopefully, my tool is telling you that universal basic income is a tricky thing. On the one hand, I'm really in favor of it, especially as an economist. It gets rid of a lot of the problems of just having pro income based programs. It's very attractive. Um, and it gives a basic fundamental safety net to everybody. So it's very, very attractive. But I hope you can hear what, what my hesitation is gonna be. And the hesitation is part of the meaning of work is that I actually did something for the community to the extent that it, it takes that away for some people. Um, I worry about that. Um, and I have gestured towards this. We have about 10% of young men who are dropping out of the workforce. It's some fairly large number, including relatives near and dear to me. I've never been to a conference where I didn't have other colleagues who had, and they're always boys, who are, they call themselves fail sons, um, and they're in the basement. And I just really worry about what universal basic income is going to do for them, because it's just going to keep them there. So. Um, what is the proper role of power um, in business, workplaces, work relations. Okay. Well, I should say, first off, I do not do a lot of political thinking. That's, I had enough to do the econ and theology things, so I hope you give me a pass on that. But I do think there's a distinction that people in this secular imaginary often lose sight of, and that is power is just power. Whereas from the more Christian, Thomistic, Aristotelian point of view, we want to make a distinction between power and authority. It really is true that, true that humans actually are hierarchical. There are some hierarchical relationships that we couldn't do without. The most obvious one being parents need to have some authority over their children, clearly. Teachers need to have some authority over their students. That's how we learn from, right? Just generationally, the young need to, need to be guided into their maturity. <clears throat> and then there's other situations. If you're at war, it's probably good to have a unit commander, right? You need to have leadership. Authority is when the leader is exercising that power on behalf of the good of the community, on behalf of the good of the people there. And then the raw naked power that we're so fearful of is when I just exercise that power for myself. So the key distinction is how do I exercise it in my life? But you, I don't think you can get away from power. I think it's a mistake to think that somehow we could level everything out and have pure quality. I just don't think humans are like that way. So what might Aquinas say about the socialist calculation debate. In particular, the problem that it's quite difficult uh, to learn how goods uh, might be directed towards their most beneficial ends um, without price signals. And yes, you might be skeptical of luxury yachts, but I'm thinking of the global reduction of absolute poverty in the 20th century. Yeah. Um, if I understand that question correctly, can I give a good Thomistic account of why markets are good? Um, I don't actually know what 
Aquinas himself would have said, because he was before this question was taken up to him, but my Aquinas, I find this a lot. Um, and I have a whole chapter, chapter five, that talks about Marcus provide very good signals about what's a value to the community and helps direct our resources. Um, and, and you don't want to do without those signals. But it seems to me that you can have a good firm that's not directly trying to maximize profits, it's trying to produce this good, trying to generate all those other goods. But the profits then or losses serve as a signal about how well they're doing it. And it's going to discipline them, right? And channel them in the right directions. So I think all that's happened in our world is we took what's a very valuable thing in terms of the signal in the markets and reified it and treated it as new. And, and Aquinas does address this. Um, I don't know if he's alone. It's very rare for a pre-modern thinker to think that merchants might actually have a purpose in life. But when he takes up whether merchants can actually justly trade, because they buy, they buy low and they sell high, how could that possibly be just? And he says, well, insofar as they're taking risks to go across the Alps to bring back those goods, they're performing, you know, they're performing a service. The problem is because they're trading good money, you might be tempted to think that the end is making those profits, not performing the service of provisioning their customers through their trading activities. Um, so he's worried about that. Um, yeah. What about lending money at interest? Yeah, my book explicitly dodges that question. <laughs> If you use the principles about whether trade is just, my guess is that some bit of our economy is in fact pure usury. I think that's probably right. But it is also the case that a lot of interest taking is not just pure usury, it's compensation for various goods or services that are offered. Um, the bank that originates the mortgage, which does need a good service of letting you live in your house before you can pay for it, has to, you know, has to make sure that you have the resources to do it. They, that's the service, right? Then they have to service the loan and keep it going. They deserve a compensation for it. They deserve some interest rate. Um, we all know that there should be compensation for inflation. We're gonna have to remember that now. <laughs> um, there's a lot of reasons why there should be some interest taking. So, but, but it does seem like because money now is scarce relative to money tomorrow, that there's a tendency to use power. Like just because I have an advantage every year, I'm gonna claim that. Um, in the Middle Ages, they saw that it was all entangled and they saw the value of interest taking and all these different concerns. And they actually had an interesting remedy. The remedy was to tell their very Catholic bankers, go and do your business and then do a lot of penance. <laughs> because it's inherently fallen. But if there's also, it's just, it's all, it's the weeds and the tears. It's all mixed up. Oh, and then, by the way, lead your proceeds to the church. <laughs> so. um, you talked about this issue uh, relative to the pandemic and uh, uh, trends somewhat, but the question goes this way. Today, the standard of living is commonly set by two-income households. Do you see a way out of this trap for women who generally uh, want to stay at home and care for their children while they are young? This is going to require a collective solution. So when people always, when you do the kind of stuff that I do, people always expect my five-point plan for how to make the world a better place. And I deliver, I kind of realized, I think it's a feature, not a bug. Um, what you need in order for any plan to work is for people to have good hearts, and that's what's in scarce supply, right? And if you have people who do not have good hearts, it's true that the various liberal institutions can discipline those hearts and maybe get some good outcomes. That's been the modern promise all along. Um, but, we, but we push at the boundaries and we break them down, right? So I'm after cultural conversion. So how does that happen? I give these talks, I teach my students, I try to spread this idea so that people can start looking at their own lives and figuring out how to do that. Um, there's a lot of social pressure to how we set up our standard of living. The social pressure right now seems to require two, you know, two or nine households. How do we get out of that? A few brave souls have to start doing it some other way and, get some, and make some social space for their friends to come along with them. We know that social change happens through that mechanism. In my lifetime, when I first arrived at Harvard, I was a smoker, so I was able to smoke in the library. It was completely fine. People smoked in the lecture halls. That's a big, big change in the culture. So it's possible. 
and we have hope with that department. Um, one of the great threats to a good uh, theology of work would seem to be, uh, or could be, transhumanism or similar utopian kinds of programs. Um, what do we do about that? Can you talk about what transhumanism is uh, before you answer that question? Um, it's one of those terms that get added around, and I haven't followed it. I, when I hear the term, this is what I think, but you all feel free to correct me. Um, we are somehow going to transcend our human limitations. Maybe I will upload my brain to a computer and live on forever. Um, or we will genetically enhance ourselves to the point where we're no longer fully human. Am I in the right ballpark? Thank you. Notice what's wrong with that from a Catholic point of view. If I think that my whole job is to perfect my nature, it's imagining that it's, it's back on that ladder, imagining some open-ended thing that gets past it. Um, and from my point of view, it's taking us away from our true happiness, not towards it. So um, it just is a representation of the modern vice. So as a last question, and this is, um, I think it allows you to take it in a number of different directions. Um, what should we think about economic self-interest given the obligation to charity? Okay, it's usually my number one question. <laughs> so, especially when I'm talking to lay audiences, they line about the door going, okay, I heard what you said about how I should have enough is enough, but how do I know? How much should I need? Um, and the answer is complicated because there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. We know that we're in a culture, I hope this goes without saying, we as Americans are in a culture where the standard of living, social pressures, ask us to maintain a very high, very large footprint, right? Um, so we know we should try to resist that as much as we can. On the other hand, you have to fit in. Part of your good as a social creature is to conform to the norms of your, your community. So you have to discern what's the place that I could go that challenges the norms, but still allows me to live within those frames, you know. Um, and it's going to depend on what my occupation, what my occupation is. So for me, I'm single. Um, so my professor, uh, salary as a professor more than meets my needs. So I'm in this happy. But I should not imagine that I want to get a raise or get a bigger house, right? I can figure out that I need a relatively small house. I don't need the greatest clothes. You know, I need what I need, but not much more. So somebody's got a family, they have other concerns to worry about. They might have higher aspirations. So that might set their bar. Um, I have a friend, she has a large family, but she also has a vocation to hospitality. She does a lot in terms of bringing the community together through parties and, and things like that. She has a nice house and she should because it serves her vocation. Um, but whatever that is, once you have it figured out for yourself, then your charity is whatever is above that. So that part's easy. The hard part is figuring out the Well, thank you so much.